All right. Um, so thank you very much. Um, uh, I have uh, entitled my talk Architectures of Grain, plural, um, and five effects of the political economy of wheat on the built environment from Cairo to Chicago. Um, and I will uh, explain a little bit where this uh, research actually comes from, basically by giving a bit of context um, and background. Um, so in 2011, uh, as global food prices went up, a uh, street food seller set himself in fire in a rural town of um, Tunisia, initiating what then became the Tunisian Revolution, um, leading to the fall of the President Ben Ali and demonstration across the Middle East in the so-called autocracies of bread, um, Yemen, uh, Bahrain, Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. And you would see um, in all of these um, pictures that I collected from the demonstration that bread um, appears uh, prominently in various form uh, as the colonial baguette, uh, but also as the more typical um, flat bread. Uh, and this is maybe what uh, started as a research and as a kind of intriguing um, element and uh, basically uh, um, became a, an entire PhD. <laughs> so don't underestimate the power of the um, image. Um, so while these demonstrations were actually, uh, let's say, generated by high food prices, the protests that they uh, sparked were including demands for democracy, social justice and freedom, basically broader... Uh, social and political issues than just the cost of basic necessities and resulted in important political shifts. Millions of Egyptians came down to the streets in nationwide protest. This uprising defies any definitions. People are gathering in the largest demonstrations against President Hosni Mubarak. Mubarak. <laughs> Um, so just just to kind of little remember, but uh, remember remembering uh, of what actually happened. This uh, what was said to be bread riots of the Arab Spring can actually be considered as the uh, initiating spark of the research, uh, offering a point of departure by linking these high food prices and uh, global economy to local forms of urbanization and political dissent, uh, prompting questions that form um, the very body of my work, actually. So, um, to etab establish what is this political economy of food system that I mentioned in the title, and by extension uh, of wheat and bread, I use uh, Harriet Friedman's concept of food regimes, or food orders. Um, so, following a first food regime based upon colonial trade in bulk commodities like wheat and sugar, and a second food regime typified by industrial architect, um, agriculture and manufactured goods, the current uh, third food regime, so the one we are actually in, would be uh, led by global corporations that profit uh, from the reorganization of agri-food chain. I will um, develop a bit. So. From uh, Friedman's perspective, rich countries have led poorer nations into dependency and debt and ruled the present world food system. She argues that years of heavy debt service, structural adjustment programs, market integration, food aid, and the influence of the World Bank and of the International Monetary, F Monetary Fund uh, has intensified the current dependence of developing countries on cheap food imports. And you will see on this map uh, of trade, this is the trade flows of uh, Jerome Wheat. Yes, um, uh, that shows that the top importing countries uh, also experience, experience food riots. Um, uh, and this notion of political economy of food actually serves to illuminate processes of exploitation and to question spatial relations between the global grain trade and local territorial organization. So to analyze in detail uh, the grain chain, I used a, a method um, uh, borrowed from sociology, the global commodity chain analysis that looks at networks of labor and production processes whose end result is a finished commodity linking household enterprises and states to one another within the world economy. So I identified and mapped uh, the material flows of grain into sectors and agents, starting with input, so the seed and fertilizing industry, production, farmers and agribusinesses, transportation companies, rail, sea and roads, processing, uh, the milling and the food industry, also the bakers, um, the distribution, 
supermarket chains, food stores, and food aid networks, uh, consumption, so everyone, you, me, uh, and involved also at all levels. Um, you would see f up, up there um, financial um, trading and institutional agents, banks, trading uh, businesses, policy makers, and the state. Um, from there, I then uncovered the uh, driving forces involved in the grain chain globally. Um, from input agents, uh, like uh, former Monsanto, now Bayer, to production agents, which is perhaps the least capitalized segment uh, so far, to uh, grain trading companies such as Cargill or Glencore, transportation firms like Clarkson, to uh, processing um, industry actors like Barilla or Bunch, and distribution agents um, Mondelez and Nestle. This is a very small um, uh, kind of diagram, but we all know it. Actually, it's this uh, kind of consolidated um, uh, food uh, processing and distributing agents. Two consumption agents, basically, uh, the dark blue in this very small map is actually the the, mo the darkest blue is the ones who consum consume the most um, wheat in one form or the other. Um, and then finally, all the financial agents, uh, such as hedge funds, BlackRock, and even the World Trade Organization can be uh, fitting in that. And with that, you have a kind of snapshot uh, of the major agents uh, that shows who is behind our food system in terms of capital, volumes, and power. And this delivers... Uh, what I consider to be a clear image of the political economy of food, as mentioned by Friedman. I then set into identifying how these agents actually affect space and looked in, uh, into their spatial production and also their geographical position. And uh, the diagram th that you have here, of course, can only uh, materialize some uh, as examples. So it's a sort of inventory of the spaces that corresponds to the grain uh, chain agents and actions the infrastructure of the grain chain, if you will. So from uh, the greenhouse um, that are used for producing the seeds, actually, to um, areas of production, uh, farms and silos, to the transportation infrastructure that are harbors, docks, warehouses, grain elevators, even the maritime sea routes that are actually uh, on which the ships are transporting um, the commodity, to uh, the processing industry um, and uh, mills, to distribution spaces such as shops and bakeries, consumption spaces uh, that are cities and homes, and um, the spaces that are generated by the more abstract economic activities uh, that are research centers, irrigation infrastructure in a way, factories, stock exchanges, and other industrial buildings. So with this catalog, I kind of established the link between the grain flows, the global economy, and space production. Um, and with, within these, and also for the purpose of today, uh, I have selected five buildings or construction that materialize these effects of the political economy of wheat on the built environment. Two um, are in the um, global context, so that would be the grain silo, uh, and the office building uh, as kind of typologies, and three uh, in the Egyptian context, more in detail, uh, that would be the bakery and uh, an informal residential building and a pumping station. So, uh, worldwide, basically, wheat um, is obtained from cultivated soil, either by small and medium-sized farms or by large commercial facilities. The specific spatial outputs are correlated within these modes of food production. So taking into account land use, irrigation, workforce and crop rotation management, seed procuring and planting, applications of pesticides and fertilizers, harvesting and storage, farming is a transcalar practice of spatial organization, recognizable through the way agricultural practice uh, of production has shaped the land. Uh, and even dotted it with a particular infrastructure. So I just have a few um, uh, examples here with how service buildings and homes and property lines um, are, or like large si uh, irrigation, cultivation patterns um, or technical invasion um, has uh, uh, shaped the land. So um, here you have the example of uh, the water channels of Egypt um, and uh, even the arti artificial topography of the Ever Hongsha leveling program in Albania, as another example. Um, so the grain elevator as my first um, building is uh, 
let's say, a paradigmatic example of the architecture that is produced at the service of grain as it needs, um, grain needs to be stored in protected spaces once it's uh, harvested. And this need has generated a striking architectural type, which has even reached uh, actually cult status among architects. It's the, um, the grain elevator. Um, it's a typology that's actually born in North America, and there are over 400 silos uh, still operating in the US. Uh, worldwide, most of those are located into producing and exporting countries or at the arrival harbors um, of importing countries. Um, but so just to kind of uh, con contextualize this uh, um, story of how the elevator is a, a kind of an iconic um, place in architectural history, uh, Corbusier, Eric Mendelssohn, and Ludwig Mies van der, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, sorry. So um, the concrete elevators of the Great Lakes as the triumph of American technical ingenuity and new materials. Um, and James Sterling uh, in the Architectural Review in 1957 saw these vernacular buildings as example of the direct expression of the actual accommodation volumes of architecture. Um, both Colin Rowe and Rainer Benham actually also show how the structure became so important to modern architecture. Uh, and also, actually, David Harvey in the condition of postmodernity highlights that. So, the grain elevator uh, also has been studied as its uh, for for its formative role in the urbanism uh, of the American city of the Midwest. Um, but all of the above is basically uh, devoid of the question of the political economy and how it serves as a um, as a tool. So, if you wish, on the one hand, it's perhaps one of the clearest examples of the machine aesthetic of form, following function, following form follows function. The building looks the way it does for a very practical reason. Um, it's usually made of steel or reinforced concrete, and the grain is then lifted, and it falls into tanks. It's actually a very dangerous um, uh, operation to, uh, to manage, uh, and there are a lot of um, casualties. Um, in this in this operation, uh, they are then emptied by gravity flow and conveyors, and the grain is then conveyed, blended, and weighted, and then it goes into trucks, railroad cars, or barge for shipment. On the other hand, and quoting Atiyah Korokivala, uh, the silo operates as a quantitative architecture. It's a calculable infrastructure deployed against the incalculability of weather and hoarding, absorbing surpluses and augmenting shortages to manipulate the market in wheat. Without the silo, uh, in the, in, there are a lot of still a few places where there are not so many silos. Then the wheat, the commodity, is kind of exposed to weather, and you cannot store it to sell it later at a, um, for instance, at a higher price. So this is a kind of, um, uh, let's say, materialized aspect of the political economy of food. Um, now, directly related to this commodification and finalization of wheat, uh, the second example of the architecture of wheat that I want to talk about is this kind of office building, by default of a better name, because we're here talking about the architecture of trade. Um, so trading agents, broker agencies, and private trading houses are another spatial corollary of the food system. The international modern wheat trade emerged uh, with the first standard contracts drafted in London in 18. 46. And here you have the Baltic Exchange, which is a London-based century-old marketplace for sheep freight transaction, but which was established um, in 1744 as a grain exchange. Um, and it's a trading institution and a very important provider of facilities for fixing the, the price of uh, cargo uh, for the, the vessels that are then transporting grain. And now, revealing of the power enshrined uh, in this uh, neoclassic architecture and its symbol at the heart of uh, London as the capital, as a, as a financial center, uh, the building was bombed by the IRA in 1992, uh, as actually traders were celebrating a jump in the share values following the right-wing Conservative Party fourth election victory in a row the previous day. Um, and the building was actually so damaged that it was not... Uh, rebuilt and it was replaced by the Gherkin, another edifice quite symbolic uh, of wealth and power as well. Um, but today's most important grain exchange is the Chicago Board of Train, which was uh, originally a central dealing facilities where farmers and dealers would deal in spot grain and exchange uh, wheat crops for immediate cash settlement. So um, something that actually doesn't exist almost anymore. Um, it was established around 1870. At the same time that uh, 
uh, Louis Dreyfus and Continental, uh, as well as Cargill, this very important trade uh, institution were established. So um, today, Chicago remains the biggest commercial grain trading for, uh, center. Um, and why is that? Um, well, the current hegemony of uh, North American grain in the world wheat trade is related to the country's national development and the expansion of cultivation toward its western and native territories in early um, 1850s. So the improvement in harvesting equipment and waterways, as well as um, storage, so the, the silo that we saw before, um, enable the farmers to, um, to store the grain, but also to ship it to Chicago and Milwaukee, where they would be, um, the, it would be bought and traded. So uh, when, as soon as the grain input became reliable, transport cheaper and faster, this also marked the entry of American wheat um, into Europe. So here you have also the kind of the or some of the origin of the current um, uh, world food order. So the building itself, you have it here on the frontispiece um, of, of the building on either side of that clock uh, that, is, um, that is on its facade. You have these two magnificent stone sculpture. Um, one is an Egyptian man with a sheaf of wheat and the other one is a Native American man with a, a ear of corn. And here you have basically trade, territorial claims and cereal in a, in a kind of grand representation with some something that I would define as a cruel irony because um, contemporary Egypt is actually struggling for food security and is uh, one of the major purcha purchasers of exported um, U.S. grain. And the supremacy of North America is also related to the appropriation of native territories. So this kind of, um, uh, let's say, uh, depictions are, are um, kind of disturbing in a way, if you wish. Um, and on top of the building, holding a wheat, uh, also wheat and corn, you have the faceless statue of Ceres, which is the Roman goddess of agriculture and grain that actually caps the edifice. And what I would argue is that the building itself is the locus and the manifestation of the American grain trade and the architectural expression of this hegemony. And it, at the time, it was the highest skyscraper um, um, in the city in 1930. Um, great trading firms have maintained this prestige and privilege associated with their strategic global positioning in the Northern Hemisphere. Major traders still operate from export hubs in North America and Europe, with, uh, together with Geneva, which is also the um, headquarters of the World Trade Organization. So the price setting epicenter of grain remains Chicago, however, which is um, uh, so And here you have the, the Board of Trade with a, a very um, a famous image of Gorski. Uh, this doesn't exist anymore, but uh, the, let's say even, even though uh, trading has moved to the immaterial spaces of online finance, um, the last cry pit was closed in 2017, it still retains um, this kind of uh, hegemony on price setting uh, for wheat. Um, the headquarters of three of the uh, four major traders, here you have uh, in glass high-rises that are located in business areas of, of um, lead cities, are rather generic and uh, anonymous buildings. Um, and here you have three in the US and one in Europe. Um, this one is in Amsterdam, it's Dreyfus. Uh, the others are um, Bunge and um, ADM in Chicago, Bunge and Cargill, which are uh, this kind of uh, ABCD, the most important grain traders uh, worldwide. Um, but somehow there is little sign of their presence. Uh, it's almost like they would play down their central role in the world order. What can be uncovered by mapping uh, the locations of these headquarters and the financial centers is the, cons let's say, concerted spatial patterns of capital accumulation in this uh, territorial distribution of trade. For instance, uh, so Chicago and Geneva, um, which uh, Geneva is also the second world grain train center, emerge as trading hubs due to their specific historical circumstances and have retained, uh, as I mentioned, their global dominance, um, which says much also about the role of grain, train in the grain trade in the development of urban areas, um, as described in uh, uh, William Cronin's excellent study of Chicago, for instance. Um, so I already mentioned it's related to uh, um, the kind of uh, presence of sufficient storage facilities and using uh, these volumes as buffer, but also related to the subsidy system that supports the farming industry and the export activities um, uh, in the US. So 
perhaps we could um, say that this geography confirms uh, the system of global financial centers um, as nodes uh, in the global economy that uh, uh, Saskia Sassen uh, formulated in the global city where she asserts that new forms of territorial centralization of top-level management and control uh, and control functions tend to locate in cities. And this is even more um, uh, true as the dematerialization of trade um, is actually still necessary, uh, still needs a, a kind of a, a grounded uh, infrastructures. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, 10 more minutes. Okay. okay. Uh, I have three more buildings, so I have to speed up. Um, the three other buildings that I want to talk about are all in Egypt. One is in Alexandria, the other one is in Cairo, and the last one is in Upper Egypt. Um, so, one, two, three. Um, they all somehow reveal how the political economy of food system uh, and wheat impacts space locally. Um, so this uh, is the Gleam Bakery in central Alexandria. It's a very small structure in the middle of the city that is uh, almost hidden by the trees. And there's just a, a board on the roof that says Gleam Bakery. There's also a small crowd that is pressed against the bars that uh, protect the sale counters. And it's a, a kind of a, a sheltered building. This is because Egypt runs a program of bread subsidies institutionalized by Gamal Nasser in the 1950s. Um, Nasser offered a sort of social contract where the state would be authoritarian, but would also provide jobs and services and bread. So over time, uh, subsidized bread became a, a strong symbol of this social contract between the government and the population, a way for the state to promote social equity and political stability. And some see it also as an instrument of wealth redistribution. But since Nasser, uh, governments have kept the political authoritarian side while reducing the economic end of the deal, um, which perhaps explains why bread appears in demonstrations as well. And um, for instance, uh, the, the loaf has remained, like the price of bread has remained the same since 1989, but it has shrank in uh, size. It became uh, more and more um, light. Um, bread actually used to be until 2014 available to all urban consumers of all income levels without any restriction, uh, restriction and it's sold in these public bakeries like the one I just um, showed and also licensed uh, stores. But now there is a system of uh, smart card that restrict access to the car holders but they're still 70% of the population. So. In order to sustain these uh, bread uh, subsidies, Egypt is of course dependent on foreign grain imports. Um, and here I have um, um, somehow used uh, the architecture to kind of trace it in Alexandria, looking at these bakeries are as architectural objects that served as the entry point to the research and then toward upstream supply. So it was possible to identify the flour, the flour mills that process the grain so the, the building on the top uh, left is a bakery, is a, a public bakery. Um, and then uh, the mill, where the, the grain is coming from, and you have the de delivery truck with the grain bags in front of it. The grain is stored in this massive harbor silo. Um, after entering the country via the grain terminal of Alexandria that is here, um, that, that is actually the national grain reserve. All the grain uh, of the country is stored there. Um, via this grain birth, it has arrived from uh, mostly Black Sea. I mean, e Egypt uh, buys either from uh, the Black Sea region or from the U.S. Um, and in this case, uh, the U.S. is, um, in this case, this is uh, uh, going through the um, Bosphorus. Um, up to actually the Novosilsk uh, grain plant in in, uh, in Crimea, and then the production field of Ukraine and Russia. So you have here an entire geographical and infrastructural space that I actually have um, defined as territory of grain. Um, but the building itself, to go back to these architectures of grain, is uh, is an object that is located in in an urban space embedded into uh, the wheat supply system and also in the larger context of the world, um, the world food system. It's somehow a locally grounded agent of food processing and distribution of the global grain chain. And it emerges as a materialized political tool 
one of thousands of other uh, public bakeries in urban centers across Egypt, somehow an example of the political agency of architecture. What can be said is that the global grain trade is partially propelled by Egyptian food policies that create an apparatus of organization and logistics that forms territories of grain. And that this large-scale system of procurement is the physical manifestation of the Egyptian dependency on world grain while playing a role in determining the use, the face, and the shape of the city. Um, this force, the fourth building I want to talk about is uh, located in the immediate periphery of uh, central Car Cairo. It's a uh, incrementally built, uh, illegally built over agrarian land and somehow representative of the physical fabric that is generated by informal housing production. It stands also as a symbol of competition um, for land use. You see on the back of the image um, what is left of, a, of a, the agrarian land on which it is built. So this is kind of a, a symbol of this competition between, land, between agriculture and urbanization, and also of the ongoing um, destruction of the local food system. Destruction that is partially fueled by the nation dependency on foreign wheat. So this is the cadaster plan of um, the peri-urban area of Cairo, pre-1950. And you can make out uh, Egypt's particular form of agrarian field, this kind of very, um, uh, it's called the Fedan, it's a longitudinal field of 200 meters by 17 meters wide. Um, it's kind of a, a form that is inherited uh, by, it comes from inheritance laws and irrigation constraints. Um, <clears throat> and so this map kind of redrawn show uh, uh, the, the arrival of the city. On the right side here is the area of Mohandesin in the 1970s. And actually everything here is still agrarian. You can see a bit of uh, informal um, areas creeping in or early 1970s. Um, and that's how it looks like today. So um, there are several reasons for that. Of course, uh, rural migration and the lack of affordable housing has uh, pushes this type of construction. And also like, liberalization processes have rendered agriculture uh, less profitable and fragilized the rural population. There is also a total lack of rural investment um, in Egypt. I mean, at least we could discuss that, but um, it, it's uh, definitely fueling uh, the migration to the city. Um, and this population doesn't have access to uh, any kind of uh, housing, so this is the result. So somehow you have a restructuration of territory that emerges um, in this new urban form that mirrors uh, former property limits of fields with these longitudinal streetscapes that you see here, um, kind of like urban canyons that are mirroring the um, property lines. This is the process of growth. So these fedans, they are actually subdivided in smaller units that are um, related to agrarian practices. The owner would sell a piece of the land and some construction would appear. Uh, the canals would be filled to create an access road. The buildings multiply and they start to affect the agrarian practice um, as the land, uh, land price goes up and agriculture becomes less uh, profitable. You get um, shade of the building, trash and so on. Uh, the tenants are evicted uh, thanks to Law 96 uh, from 1992 that was passed under Mubarak, which lifted the protection instituted by Nasser in the 1950s uh, for peasants and for tenants of, of uh, farms and uh, fields. And finally, the entire fedan is constructed and the area is urbanized. Um, this is the typical architecture that is generated by these processes. It's built uh, on these small plots um, of uh, 12 by 14 meter, blind on three facades, uh, with the full occupancy of the plot. Um, so I'm going to pass a bit. So this is the. Uh, so in a way, this building. So on the on what you have um, is on the left the typical small scale, one floor per year, and the new one is basically like uh, fueled by also capital and and the kind of certain formalization of of growth with a, a one-off 15 story. They actually tell the tale of the destruction sorry, of local agriculture by these uh, self-organizing or semi-formal groups. Um, it's a spatial transformation that um, maybe can be related to what Henri Lefebvre calls the death of the peasantry, um, the lost battle between agriculture and urbanization, uh, which has implication at a national and global level. 
uh, as for instance with the growing food dependencies of this population who also rely on food subsi on bread subsidies. So as urbanization plays a major role in increasing bread consumption, it also obliterates the local source of its production. And 60% of uh, Cairo live in informal areas of um, this type. So I'm, I just want to make a link with the beginning, which uh, this question of unjust urbanism, these areas is of course underserviced, also fueled the revolution uh, of 2011. So here you see a kind of convergence of forces, um, which I, I argue is in fact a product of this political economy of food. So the last building I want to talk about, so I'm going to go a little bit over time, sorry about that. Um, is the Mubarak pumping station. Here you see uh, behind uh, President Hosni Mubarak, I have an entire collection of press photography where he's like looking at this building because um, uh, he went many times. Um, he was kind of, it was kind of a pet project, presidential project. Uh, it's called Toshka Project and uh, the pumping station is just one, is the initiating infrastructure. Uh, it's the largest in the world. Uh, it pumps water from the Nile, from Lake Nasser, the uh, artificial lake that is uh, formed by the Aswan Dam, and conducts it in a, a network of irrigation channels, which in turn irrigate hectares of land reclamation fields, all um, dedicated to uh, agriculture. So the goal of Toshka is to go out from the Nile Valley and to set up new cities in the desert. It was a uh, Mubarak solution for Egypt's overpopulation, food insecurity and unemployment in one massive project. It offers a built solution as a substitute to public policies. Um, I'm going to speed up a bit, but uh, there is a, a wealth of this kind of project. Um, uh, in Egypt, uh, which all have served as instruments of political hegemony and social control, and uh, also, of course, in relation to the river. So I'm going to skip a bit. Um, so it's something that can be grounded, as um, Nasser made this kind of uh, speech on how he would ask people to go to the um, to go to the desert and uh, make a making a parallel Nile, um, which was so somehow Toshka find its origin into this. I'm, I'm speeding up. So, um, in fact, the idea um, originated in, a, in an overflow canal. The original, very original idea was this, um, that they just needed a, a kind of uh, exit for the water in case it would uh, put too much pressure on the dam. And then um, uh, the, the, the lakes, so the, the lakes that you see filling up here are actually not related to the project, but they kind of inspired it. They, it revived this idea of doing a new, a new valley. And uh, actually the lakes have almost uh, evaporated today. Um, so perhaps the idea of reclaiming desert land for food security has turned into a cash uh, pro crop project because actually private agribusinesses are producing fruits for exports and very few wheat, which was the origin of the project. Actually, you see the Toshka project, um, so the pump is here, and then you see the land reclaimed field with this kind of central pivot irrigation. Originally, it was sold as um, uh, making the country self-sustain in food and produce wheat, um, and in now it's producing actually uh, uh, fruits for exports. Uh, there are also massive, unsurprisingly, uh, evaporation problems and salinity. It's actually considered to be dysfunctional. So this building, in a way, uh, embodies several features of the political economy of food. It shows how food security became both a political imperative and an argument to legitimize technocratic infrastructure. It also symbolizes control over capital, water, land, topography, and population and agriculture and food production as a recurrent story of power struggles over territory, people and resources. It's an infrastructure with visible spatial consequences and an outcome of a particular political economy of food. So with these five buildings or constructions that materialize the effects of the political economy of wheat on the built environment, I try to identify how commodities affect the built environment from an architectural, urban and spatial point of view and to highlight the mechanisms producing and shaping territory. Operative buildings, such as farms, offices, uh, logistic company headquarters, supplementary structures, structures like warehouses or storage spaces, or sizable infrastructure, such as grain elevators, harbor loading berth and terminals, train and road networks, or marine routes, in some form the spatial armature of the global food chain, uh, manifesting a logistical network of compliant generic architecture and infrastructure tuned to respond to standardized protocols of trade and perform routine operation. To quote Keller Easterling, uh, 
Each part of the chain is but a dumb component that gains intelligence in multiples. And as a concluding uh, open remark, I would also like to place the study of the built environment um, that I did here in conversation with Michel Foucault, Biopolitical Concepts, arguing that food systems affect the ways that power is exercised over people and place, and that the architectures of grain is a materialized form of biopolitics. Thank you. Thank you.